Hotel. Yes, good. It's good to see y'all. Wow. Uh, we are going live again, and we welcome all the people who are here from around the world uh, on YouTube. Uh, we have uh, had a wonderful uh, program, almost um, uh, in terms of just the continuation of the MKA lecture series. And today, uh, we are just very, very happy, very proud. We have a very intelligent uh, young man, uh, Brother Tugu Sanusi, who is going to speak to us about uh, an issue in the African world that we are all confronted with because uh, all humans actually came from the continent of Africa. And we recognize that uh, some parts of the human world have uh, has expressed uh, some part has expressed itself uh, as a superior uh, uh, people, and that has created many many of the problems that we hear uh, we know about and we hear about every day. Uh, my name is Molefe Kete Asante. I am, of course, uh, very happy uh, to be here. Um, my ancestry on my mother's side uh, extends to Sudan, so I'm always happy to hear issues regarding Sudan. Uh, it is a country that is in uh, some turmoil, but it's been in turmoil for a long time. The uh, Sudanese people uh, are a very powerful African nation. And they have done many, many marvelous things historically. We, we are not yet able to tell how deep and important this history is. We do know about uh, the various empi uh, empires and kingdoms of Nubia. Um, we know about Saba, which uh, the Arabs renamed Meroe. Uh, we know about Napata, for example. We know about the land of Cush, but we don't know everything we need to know about this great African uh, area because it has been overlaid with a culture and a heritage that is not African in the sense that it has been imposed almost like in the United States, the Europeans imposed in the United States a particular heritage on the native people, on the indigenous people. So if you talk about the Lenape people who are here in um, uh, uh, the Philadelphia area, uh, that's a very important thing because uh, the, the Lenape were the original people in this area. But if you talk to most people, they don't know about the Lenape, you see? And throughout this country, the same way, the same way in South America, the same way in what is called uh, Central America, which is not a continent, but part of North America, it's the same way, you see? And it's the same thing that has happened in Australia. Wherever you have uh, colonization, invasion, imposition of one people on another people, you will have these situations. So, um, so we're going to get a, a nice, wonderful lesson today, and we need these lessons because the only way we can destroy uh, the uh, in illusionary notion of a racial ladder with uh, white people at the top and black people at the bottom is to encounter this problem and to attack it because it is uh, not only false and unethical, uh, it is uh, something that has uh, destroyed the ambition and the interests of people around the world. So uh, we have to be ready to impose a new culture, a culture that comes to us from the very uh, grounds of ancient Africa, uh, the antiquity of the Nile Valley civilizations and other civilizations throughout the African continent that gave us ma'aticity, the notion of ma'at, the ideas of truth, justice, order, uh, harmony, balance, uh, reciprocity. Uh, these are, you know, 
this is very basic to us. You see, very basic to society. So at this time, I'm introducing uh, uh, young brother Tugu Sanusi. Uh, brother Sanusi is originally from a region of Sudan that's called Darfur. Uh, you, you may have heard of it. You should have. It's been in the news. Uh, people have been talking about it uh, for years. It's a huge area of the country of Sudan, which is one of the uh, largest countries, was uh, even larger than it is now uh, in uh, Africa, but uh, certainly top, he'll tell us more. Top s is either number one or number two or uh, number three in the continent of Africa, but Darfur itself is as large as a country of France. So that's a huge territory. When you think of how big France is, and then you think of Darfur, it's a big, big area. And this brother is from Darfur. He, um, he went through uh, some of the struggles of uh, Darfur, and you know they, uh, people have been fighting against those people for a long time. And I always say that it is not fighting against them because uh, all the Darfurians are not Muslims. Many of them are Muslims. So it's not about Islam. It's about the culture, you see. It's about uh, many people uh, don't like the fact that uh, some of the Darfurians, most of them, uh, want to be African. And they you don't know, have a problem being African, you see. So this is a, this brother uh, escaped, went away to uh, Khartoum, uh, one of the largest cities in Africa, lived there, went to the University of Nilane, and uh, after he left the University of uh, Nilane to, to better his life and condition and to work for, for the people of Darfur, he, he went to South Sudan. And uh, then, uh, and this is the South, see the loose flag right there. Went to South Sudan, then he went to Uganda. And um, he uh, went to South Africa, where he went to school again. I, I like the determination of the Sudanese people. It reminds me of the, the way we have to be, you know, in the world. I mean, this young man had a determination to, uh, to be the best that he could be at what he did. And he went to South Africa, uh, studied at the University of Western Cape. Uh, several of my friends uh, worked there. Uh, there's a great uh, professor, Kwesu Pra, in uh, Cape Town, uh, uh, Way Sisanti, these are strong uh, scholars uh, in that university. He went to that university, got his master's degree, and now he's a graduate student at Temple University in Philadelphia. We are very pleased. We are honored to have him. Please give a hand to Brother Tugu Sanusi. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Asante, and thank you, brothers and sisters uh, who are here today and also around the world, and my uh, community who are in Sudan and also around the world. So I'm so happy and pleased to take uh, this opportunity to <laughs> present something that has been um, a problem to not only to Sudanese, but globally and even internationally and, 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 and because of misrepresentation and misinformation uh, that have been presented to the people. So before that, I want to start with a short story, very short one, happened um, two weeks ago on campus when Dr. Asante introduced me to one of the uh, professors and then he was um, Tugu from Sudan. And then the doctor was saying, um, are you an Arab person? I said, no, I'm, I'm not an Arab person. I'm an African person. But now the question is then, what makes people assume Sudan as an Arab country? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basis on what basis they define Sudan, mm -hmm. which is the heart of Africa, yeah. and to the African, even to the world, I consider like Greece to the Europe. Mm -hmm. Sudan is the Greece of Africa. Mm -hmm. China is for Asian. Mm -hmm. So Sudan can be considered as the birthplace of all Nubian, I mean, I mean, um, Kemet of Africa. 
So with that being said, um, I'm just trying to log in onto my um, this presentation. And it doesn't pull up. Yes, here we go. Right. So I want to start a little bit with the with the map. And, and if you could see that um, there's, a, there's a yellow, which is Sudan. And I highlighted uh, Saudi Arabia. So see the Saudi Arabia on the side? Because that, that is a source of the problem, where we got to, came to Kemet, and then from Kemet, and then it spread to the whole North Africa. So if you see the issue of Arabization, and as um, uh, Dr. Asante and many people define as a process or historical and cultural and linguistic dislocation of African people that went through many um, stage, not only one, but so many centuries. And that's why always my, my question is that, how did we get here? What, what, what happened exactly? What the process that took place so that we have a type of people that they are today? So Saudi Arabia, as we know that um, in the history, we have a Kemet, and Kemet has been colonized by all these um, uh, colonial powers. We have uh, Patience, we have uh, Macedonians, we have Romans. I want to start just with the Romans that when um, in, in 639 AD, mm -hmm. when the Roman Empire was at the stake, so they, Egypt or let's say Nubia has been uh, colonized or has been already occupied. Now there's another colonial power coming into the region, capitalizing on the situation that Roman Empire was. And that was 1939. Then Arab capitalized on that, they came in seventh century. So that's why I brought the, the map, Saudi Arabia, the storm of Arabization started from Saudi Arabia to the Kemi, to the Egypt, then moved to Libya, goes to Algeria, goes to Morocco, and that whole uh, North Africa has been occupied and taken by Arab nation. Then from Egypt, Sudan immediately is blow, and it used to be one country, as, uh, as we know in the history. So it used to be called Upper and Lower Kemet. So Egypt is Upper Kemet, and Sudan is a Lower Kemet. The fact that the same civilization, Kemet and Sudan, is a continuation where the, uh, the African civilization started. So where in seventh century, Muhammad um, sent um, Arab, I mean, uh, um, uh, Umar ibn al-Az to invade Kemet. That's when Arabization started. Passionate warriors were sent with uh, um, Umar ibn al-Az to occupy Kemet. Then, um, then how did they start it? They usually started by falsifying the history. You got to rewrite the history of the people in order to position yourself or to effectively occupy people. So you got to write your history, make a top, and their history become a bottom. So they falsified the history. And then um, imposition of the religion and language and culture it started projecting Islam as a universal religion that has, has no boundaries. We will come down to some definitions of what is religion by Dr. Ray Hagan. I remember one day mm -hmm. he was speaking in this institute. And there's a lot of uh, very nice information so that we can place every mm -hmm. uh, aspect into a scientific um, uh, domain. So I just want to highlight like 10 or 11 points that has to do with the um, Arabization history. In 651, uh, Abdullah, yeah, Abdullah ibn Said or Abdullah ibn Sa'd led his army to invade Nubia, which was composed of the two kingdoms. We have a Kush kingdom and we have a Mara kingdom, and the capital was Dungula. This is the history. 
then Egypt decided to seek a new Dungula and Abdullah was defeated. So Abdullah was defeated. I got to say that point. So Egypt or at that time Arab who occupied Egypt sent a military occupation to take Dungula. Then he was defeated. So Egypt has to seek another way of occupation, which he, later on it became something called Bakht Agreement. It keep forget the Bakht. The Bakht Agreement to me as um, a, a person that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand the historical development of Arabization, it was another way of reorganizing the mission of Arabization and the methodology in which you can occupy. Because usually you don't see the agreement unless you defeat it. Mm. So if you, you are being defeated by certain force, then you gotta back up, then reorganize yourself and come up with a new methodology or tool so that I can conquer that area again. So they came and they had created a Bakhti agreement and provided three major things. That agreement um, allowed the permission of Arab from Egypt to Sudan um, to trade, to live as a citizen, and they got that opportunity to get into the deep areas of the African people so that they can see how rich the country is and the resources that are available for them if they come to, um, to colonize their people. So they were collecting information and they were um, producing Islam to the people. Because that's a major, be before Islam comes to Sudan, people gotta know it was a Christian country, con kingdom. Mm -hmm. So we were Nubian or Kush, then Roman came and then it became a Christian country. Mm -hmm. Then after Christian country, then Arab came and it became Muslim country. Mm -hmm. So the time Arab came, the Christian kingdom or Christian country was already on the place. So now when the Arab penetrated the areas of the Nubia or every uh, indigenous community of Sudanese, the aim is just to discover what is inside there. Mm -hmm. But I can't go unless I have a sort of agreement so that I can managed to pass the information to the power in, 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 in Cairo, Egypt. So in 1969, um, 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 Egypt sent Sulaim to Nubia to convert the king to Islam, but not succeeded. Mm -hmm. That's how it is. Mm -hmm. So they sent someone that convinced the, the Christian king or the king who believed in Christianity then to become a Muslim. Then they did not succeed. So he went back in, nine, in, in 12th century, Egypt requested reestablishment of the Bakht, launch attack, dispose the king, and Papi king was uh, appointed. So that's when in 12th century, they said, if he doesn't want to, we gotta send another military to occupy that country and impose our way of life, very simple. So Arabs are fully now seated in the throne flooded Sudan with their culture, language, and religion. That's in the 12th century, when now Arabs are fully seated in the power, Arabs are fully seated in the throne, and now you got a power, resources, and ability to dislocate people from all aspects of life. So in, then that continued until 1820, when Ottomans, the Turks, uh, rule from 1820 to 1885, and Islamization was accelerated at that time. So when, when Turks came, they, because Turks, they are already Muslim um, uh, kingdom. Mm -hmm. So they found already the environment or the condition is already prepared mm -hmm. for Islam process to continue and go on. However, in that case, they introduced their culture and their language. Mm -hmm. And they open more something called madrasa mm -hmm. or halawi, madaris, uh, religion uh, schools, mm -hmm. so that people can be indoctrinated, mm -hmm. people can be more Islamized and become Arab. Very simple. So that continued from Tesh was in the power until the British came and entrapped that. Now the British and Egyptian conundrum uh, or power took over in 1898. Uh, to 1956. So the Turks was on the, on, on the process 
of domination, of slavery, of everything. So British came and attracted that, then the British now fully seated in the power. So Arabization project and then was surely interrupted by British. How? When the British, um, before the independence, because the independence was 1956, and the Egypt was 1952, uh, Ghana 1957. So in, before 1956, uh, British in 1928 created something called Rajab language policy. It's a document that trying to impede, trying to mitigate the influence of our people into Sudan or even especially in South Sudan. Because the time British came, they already found that Darfur, like majority of them are Muslim. That's a fact. The eastern part of Sudan are Muslims. But they are African, indigenous African, mm -hmm. like people in Senegal, they are African, but they are Muslim. Mm -hmm. So the British came and found that already on the place. However, the South Sudan, the majority are not Muslim. Mm -hmm. And the majority of them, you might say Christian and, or, and also believe in African religion. So from my own understanding, then the British thought this is a perfect context or maybe the territory where I can keep the influence of Arab away mm -hmm. and try to have a more influence in the South mm -hmm. because it still is very, I would say, fertile yeah. soil. Mm -hmm. So they, 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 they introduced a Rajab language conference or mm -hmm. policy which Arabic is not official language in South Sudan. Mm -hmm. English is a language of the administration or official language in the country. The local languages should be developed and promoted in the way that become resources for development. Mm -hmm. That's what the British did. Also, they created a policy where it doesn't allow any person from its nose to go to the south without having a permit. You gotta have like a, something like a visa, a permit. Why are you going there? And then there's restriction. So the aim of restriction is to keep the influence of Arab away from from South. And now I gotta implement a British language, British culture. So that continued until, as I said, until uh, in um, uh, until 1956. In um, in 1956. Arab nationalists reversed all the British policies and Arabic became official language and Islam as a religion of the state. Then what happened when the British left? So the Arab who came to the power, they just reversed the policy. So British was saying only English is official language in South Sudan. British left, now Arabic is official language, not English anymore. And Islam is a religion of the state. Not only a per but holy state. While you have a majority of the region, people in the region, almost like seven million people, the majority of them, they have a different ways of communicating to the God or communicating to cosmos code. So the imposition of religion now has been introduced by the state, which have all resources mm -hmm. that they can implement what they want to do. So then. That's what triggered revolution in 1950, before one year before the independence. That's when South Sudanese said, no, we can't be an Arab. Yes, you, you are there with your language and culture, but I'm African with my culture and language and, and, and traditions. But you can't Islamize me and Arabize me, want me to, dis, to become you. So the revolution started in 19, um, 1955, one year before the independence. One aspect I remember literature has shown that there was a policy called Sudanization. The old job center uh, that was taken by British was um, fulfilled by British. So now when the British is leaving, we got to Sudanize the job. So bring Sudanese people to fill those jobs. 800 jobs before the British left. Imagine only 60 jobs that are given to South Sudanese. From out of 800. So how just... How can that not trigger a revolution? Or wh what's going on? Mm -hmm. So th that's a one element. I mean, apart from so many things, that's a one aspect also contributing into revolution, 1955. 
So today, see, the struggle continued from 1955 until 2005 when the peace agreement came in 2011 when South Sudan became a fully independent country. That struggle was for more than 50 years. Right. Revolution started. Then another revolution started in Darfur in 2000 up to now. There's a revolution going on. Simply because of what? We, 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 we are not Arab. We are, yes, we are Sudanese, we are Muslim, but we are not Arab. We got our culture, we got our, uh, our, our language, we got a way of doing things, but you, can, uh, you cannot, I mean, make me an Arab person. We, and then you can see that in many aspects, in the names uh, and all these kind of things. We all, too, is my African name, but my Arab name is Muhammad. Then it doesn't look on any person who say you are confused if that's really your name. There's no, part, no doubt somebody will never question that kind of, because I'm going to show some pictures to highlight that. Based on that, if we look at this picture, a phenotypes, it's clear. You can, you can tell from you know, this is an Indian guy, mm -hmm. and that's a Chinese, mm -hmm. that's a European, mm -hmm. the other one is an Arab. Mm -hmm. We have then um, a Shapton, <laughs> and, and, and we have, because I want to clear the confusion, the mm -hmm. exercise of this, there's a confusion mm -hmm, there about the black people in Sudan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because most of the time, what happened is that uh, based on American standard, when, when you look at the black people in Sudan and the lighter one, uh, they fit perfectly in the context of America. But those are not real. Those are Arabized people. So look at Bashir and Shapton and Burhan, the one who is in the power. The three guys. The three guys. So is there any difference in terms of the phenotype? They all look similar, right? So nobody in, in, in this standard, did somebody say, this guy is a, a black or African guy. You say yes, because he is similar to everybody. And then we, this is how black is defined. Mm -hmm. But absolutely, in Sudanese context, that's an Arab person. Mm -hmm. So, and the second one, this is the leader of Genjari, the one who is already now in The Hague, in International Criminal Court. He's waiting for his trial. Mm -hmm. He's waiting for trial to be, uh, he handed himself. I don't know, that's what people say. But he's waiting for his trial. So this is Arabized African who believe in Arab more than Arab themselves. Because he was the leader of Genjari, the one who commit genocide in Sudan. Mm -hmm. And these are the kind of people that then you wonder. So this guy and this one, there's no difference in terms of the phenotype. But you wonder this one defending Arab or Arabization policy more than Arab themselves who are there in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. That's where insanity comes from. Right, so here the other point that before I just jump to the phenotype, before the phenotype, um, there was something that I want to share, the tubes of Arabization, religion. So they started through the religion. And Marimba defined a religion as a formulation of ritual, dogma, and beliefs leading to the systematic uh, statement of syntactically uh, super rational, most often, it functions to sacralize a nationalistic ide ideology. It is uh, institutionalized, uh, institutionalization or institutionalized set of ideas and practices. So that's a religion. If any religion does not base on your social experience in history and culture, then that's not for you. It's very simple, based on the definition. Because religion is a explain the way of our life as, as uh, many people indicated. So what happened then if you're an African but have a different religion? Something out of context. Sudan is Africa, Darfur is Africa, South Sudan is Africa. But what, what that has to do with Saudi Arabia coming to the continent and then colonize and introducing a new religion to the people? Dislocation, as uh, Asante always tells us, from every aspect of life. Amos Wilson, or Another no way Nobels define um, religion or culture as the process which he gives the people a general design for living and patterns for interpreting the reality. That's what a culture is. It has to interpret our reality. It gives us the pattern in which in way we see ourselves. Amos Wilson, culture is a learn and is 
a result of historically and conceptually created designs and patterns for living with and relating to others as a cosmos. Asante defined turning one's uh, head to Mecca is a very symbolic of a, the same cultural insistence, which keeps a convert looking in the direction of another's culture, not his own. This particular ritual is not understandable only in the sense of Arabizing influence of the region of religion can be truly understood. Again, all people create create their religions out of their his, history. Their sane prophets and wise people are those who done admirable things within the context of their own experiences. Um, based on that, I would just want to bring this charter. If we can see. Um, divinity and Arabization. So one element they say, they define how did they embedded Arabization into divinity or into religion. Uh, they define Arabic as a language of God. Which means the other languages are not languages of a God. That's what does it mean? And it means he understands only one language then in order to communicate with him, then you got to speak in Arabic. So what happened then before even Arab came to Africa? Mm -hmm. the, the, then what were the way of people that are communicating to God? What about other, those languages? Or those languages, they don't have linguistic capability or lexical capability to convey the information to the God. Mm -hmm. That's where things start questioning. If you are saying, when I want to pray, I got to switch from my language to the Arabic. It means that a God only understands Arabic. That's what does it mean? It, it means that my language is not qualified enough to be able to communicate the information. And then by doing that, then I'm naturalizing and normalizing the relationship between putting that as a language of divinity and my language relegating the other languages into the position of not, not, not having to do with the divinity. That's what does it mean. Mm -hmm. When I practice that theoretically, practically, mm -hmm. that's what I'm justifying. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm normalizing in the life. Mm -hmm. Then my thing is, any language has ability to communicate the information with each other, with a cosmos for, before, hypothetically speaking. L imagine that even Arab were not in existence. What would be the language of God? should be Zulu or Yoruba or maybe my own language. Mm -hmm. Then I got to bring another language and then define that a language of God. So then we have a, lang a day of judgment. They say the language of day of judgment. So all of us, when we go and meet um, God one day, all these languages are going to die, and then you got to speak in Arabic. That's what they say. No, that's what exactly we are being told to. Mm -hmm. That's what we are being told. And then this is what is still existing up today. Like this is a special language that has been sacralized or mm -hmm. sacred, has a special relation with the God. It's not a natural language as other languages. Then another aspect, as uh, Dr. Asante pointed out, pilgrimage must be made in Mecca, mm -hmm. right? So, and then my question then is, um, what happened to our sacred forests or maybe mountains yeah. or to the places that we use to connect our ideas and information ourselves to the cosmos force. As Ante mentioned in the book of the, the one in, in Ampubalanga, the one in South Africa, mm -hmm. the, 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 mm -hmm. the forest of Ogosho or something like that. We have in Darfur waters, we call healing uh, waters, where water flows when you go there and then you took a sh take a shower from that water, then you'll be healed. Mm -hmm. It is there up to right now. Mm -hmm. It's a process of healing. We have a place which are very sacred. People even scared to go there. So why do we need, I need to go to Mecca to just visit there? Right. What does it mean to then to take that, that as a holy place or something that you must go there and then spend a lot of money and a lot of uh, energy and then, because if you don't visit that place, like you are not that really qualified Muslim. Yeah. You're not that really fully embracing you should do. So 
then we come to that ahead. I mean, uh, prayers. When you pray, you got to uh, uh, go that direction. That's why I brought that, that when Asante says that um, this particular ritual is really understandable to anybody. It's a symbolic of the same cultural insistence, which keeps the convert looking into the direction of someone else's culture, not his own culture. So what does has to do, all of us when we are praying, then we will say that you got to head to, 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 um, to our secret forest in that way. Everybody has to head that side. Or to the, 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 the mountain that you visited, a doctor, in, in, in Ampuvalanga. So everybody has to f face that direction. Mm -hmm. So what that has, okay, that is okay. But what happened to the African who were in the existence before even seventh century? What, were the, what, what, what direction they were facing? <laughs> um, then we have, um, yes, Muhammad is the last prophet. And as you said, the doctor, it should be the last because to, to maintain the sustain, sustainability of ideology, you got to say that this is the last one. Because if it's not the last one, then this must be the fake one. There's a new one coming. Yes, then now means you are destabilizing the ideology or the position that we created. Mm -hmm. It should be the last one, and never. And this claim is only not by them, by many religions. They have taken the same posture, yeah. the same route, or the same you know, approach. So, so then what happened to our ancestors and our people that we were in the existence? Yeah. But no, but this is the last one, and you, you shouldn't question that one. Mm -hmm. but, but it's very powerful, because we need to sustain our... Um, supremacy, I would say that, yes. to sustain our domination, yes. our culture, and it has a different is, is status from other status because it has been glorified and segregated with the God. It's connected to the. So anything that you do it this way, no, you gotta do it this mm -hmm. way, because it's it has been, let's say, um, um, justified by religion. Mm -hmm. So, in nineteen uh, in 1953. The first minister of education addressed the National Assembly and he stated that the Sudan is one country sharing one set of political institutions. This is two years before the independence, or three years. It is of a great importance that there should be one language which is understood by all of the citizens. That language could only be Arabic, and Arabic must therefore be a taught in all the schools. That was in 1950, uh, 1953. So see how Arabization started before three years before the independence. Mm -hmm. And at that time, at, at the moment, Sudan has more than 100 languages before independence of South Sudan. Mm -hmm. When the South Sudan was part of Sudan, then we have more than 200 languages. Imagine then they, they, this imposition started before the British left. So then Pra said, stating that the projection that Arabic is a language of God has historically seduced many to bend to the sweep of Arabization and Arabism. That's a, that's a major point. Mm -hmm. So wh when you're projecting that and justifying that by practicing and showing this a language of God, then that was seduce many people. You can still communicate to the God the same religion, but you can use your language. Mm -hmm. Hypothetically, let's say. Mm -hmm. So, Bala also said that the official orientation of the ruling group towards creating a pro-Arab environment by adopting Arabic culture, Arabic language, in addition to Islam, as the main features of Arabizing the Sudanese entity. The mechanism in which towards imposing this Arabization is through the use of Arabic as the official language of the country. There's no another mechanism. So I got to create a policy that says this should be official language of the country. Then I got to create those resources to impose mm -hmm. that decision in all aspects of life. Mm -hmm. Education, uh, religion, everything. It has to be this language. Mm -hmm. What about, no, these are not even languages. Mm -hmm. Because that's what we are being taught. Mm -hmm. Ours are not language. That's why people feel they, 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 they are being stigmatized. Yeah. They feel ashamed when you start speaking your own language. Mm. They will look at you very primitive, and then mm. they will even distance you. You can lose friends if you start using there, mm. especially among people who they're highly Arabized. Mm. 
Because the more you distance yourself from being an African, the more you are being incorporated into the Arab system. And the condition is to be part of the, the power, to, be, uh, to enjoy the resources, whatever cases they created, then you got to disconnect yourself. You have to decenter yourself with your African roots. Then you got to have Arab name. You got to have, uh, you got to breathe like Arab, eat like Arab. Everything should be like Arab. Then now you are there, but you are also the second class Arab, not the first one. You're not going to be the first one. You will, whatever case is, the same religion you are, but you are the second Muslim, not the first. No, this is, this is a practically there. There's a story where um, a person was refused to lead the prayers in Saudi Arabia because he's not from Saudi. He's a black person from Sudan. So you cannot lead our prayers. Because you are not, yeah, you are Muslim, but you are not qualified enough to lead the prayers for our people. Because we are the origin, and you are the copy. So how can the origin be available and then we use the copy? It can happen. So, so that's the case. That's the case happening. That's the everyday thing. So back to the exercise, as I said, then this is where confusion is. The majority of Sudanese who are in America, they are type of these people, which they look similar to Alam Shapton. Then now when you say, but we heard there is a, our people killing black African, but you look like a black like me. Then what's going on? No, nothing like that. We just uh, there's a problem here. Is that political? Uh, what, what they say? Um, economic underdevelopment, and and maybe something has to do with the roads. And, but there's no fundamental issue that that being presented to you, which is a real dislocation of African people to be our people. Nothing. They will deny. Because you, you never had a chance to get person, a real person from the ground so that you can have a correct information. That's why when I was in Western Cape, in Cape Town, and then a friend will ask me, uh, you are from Sudan? Then they say, you must be from South Sudan. Based on what? Because you, you, you are not like them, right? Like you are more like South Sudanese because that's what we have, that's what we know. South Sudan is the people like this. And uh, North Sudan is to, uh, to lighter people, people who are a bit light. The opposite, even there, they are 15%. The 85% people of Sudan, they are like me. That, but you don't see them. They are not in the, in, in, in the media. What you see in the North, you see the lighter one. But that in American standard is a black person. But in Sudan, those are wh what I call Arabized who are uh, representing Arab supremacy. That headed by Saudi Arabia. So that, that's a very, that's why I brought Shapton and this, there no difference. Here, um, I just brought these pictures. Look at, this is not for. And the question is, what, what, what led to this one? What, what happened? What exactly happened? This was the response when people say, we can't be Arab anymore. When people say, we need to go back to where we are, we need to recenter ourselves, then that was the response from the government. That was the response from Janjaweed, from Bashir, from all Arab government in Khartoum. From 2003 to up to at the moment. You, you might have seen this. But now again, the issue, it has been, um, let's say, not in the media anymore because there's so many things happen. But the main fact that I want to communicate, this is the result of the people say, we need to recenter ourselves. We need to go back. We are not a Arab. We need to be in our terms. We need to be in our language and culture and, 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 and go back to our roots. Then they were like, no, but you're already Muslim. How could you say that? You, you are an Arab person. So that's what they respond. Our villages have been burned, attacked. And this one is a, um, where that one? That's a Kofi Annan. In, when he visited that point in 2004, when he was alive, mm -hmm. he went there and he saw what happened. So and this, uh, the picture of the, this, 
This one is the IDP camp. So people were just displaced and the villages are burned as the way you see. And now they've been, they've been living in these uh, tents for almost 20 years, from 2003. Up to this moment, they're still on the camps. Whatever happened, the news about agreement, the policies, whatever they did, it's just a mitigation of the problem. They don't address the root cause of the problem because the root cause of the problem is about imposition of arabization. It's not about I need to be a manist or maybe uh, whatever cases or I, uh, you know, build some bridges. Issue is uh, bigger than that. That's what I know. But they will try to cover up to do whatever is possible to bring people into the power. And, and try to, to give it different picture, different color. So, but it's still the issue is that that's a response to, to, to when people resisted Arabization. Then the other picture, this is very important, this one. Well, these are the Janjaweeds, leaders of what they did, leaders of what happened here. So the, the first one, is a sitting president now. Well, I say he's a, he's a, he doesn't call himself president, but he's a, uh, I mean, he's in, a, he's in the charge of the country. Because he was with Bashir, and then now he removed Bashir, and then he sat in that seat. That's what exactly happened. The second one is his deputy. The second one, this one and this one, is the same person. This one, when he was, a leader of Janjaweed on the ground when he was um, doing this together with, with this one. They were both of them while Bashir was in the power. They were the one who deployed in Darfur to carry out the genocide, I mean campaigns and genocide um, uh, practices. So they removed Bashir and then they sat in that power. So now this person from being here and he's there now. So they are the two people who are running the country. Then what about this one? That's a Musa Hilal, yes, the second person. So we have a three leaders of Janjaweed, Musa Hilal and Hemiti, Burhan himself, and the fourth one, the one um, here, the one here is in the ICC, this one. He's already in the ICC, the fourth one. So... They, 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 they were the one behind the genocide every, in every village. So, and then even in the Blue, Blue Nile and even in uh, Nuba Mountain, South Kordofan, were these two people. So what happened then, they just removed Bashir and then they sat in, in the power. So now they have more resources and more ability even to practice worse than it was before. Because before, I was given an instruction to do something. But now I'm the one who, who will give an instruction to do what I want them to do. So, so and then, um, that's when, uh, when you say January, that, that those are the, the, the pictures in YouTube. Or you can look at them, they're everywhere. So that, that's how they come to the villages and then they burn like that. Simply because people say, we are not going to be silent. People revolted against the, the established order of Arabization. Very simple. Then here, what I want to say, I just want to bring a quote. As three young women in West Darfur walk in a scrubby field, they had gone out to collect a straw. They recall thinking that the Arab militiamen who were attacking Africans at the night would still be asleep but 60 men grabbed them, yelling Arabic slurs, Zurga and Abid, because this is a very uh, prominent term of uh, racial slurs in, in Sudan. Mean a black and a slave. Then, me, uh, then men raped them, beat them, and, and left them on the ground. Black girl, you are too dark. You are like a dog. We want to make a light baby. You get out of this area and leave the child when it is made. The 
The government gave me a permission to rape you. This is not your land anymore. Abi, go. That, that, that's just a one simple practices to, to this. So that's only one. And this is exactly what is in the mind of the people. The intention of not about, no, you, you got to leave this. We, we are in the charge. Nothing called Africans. So then another racial is where I want to bring this. This is um, the former um, TV and, and, and radio director of Sudan, the former one. He has been removed from the power from the, that responsible six months ago or some months ago. I, I brought because there's something very important connected to this one. This is very recent, less than three or four months. Is that um, they were sitting in the, in the courtroom and there was a charge going on. Uh, I don't call it charge, but a fake attempt. A very, very design uh, fake attempt that we need to charge Bashir, but it's not a real one. It's just an attempt that they just need to, to confuse the public. So people were sitting there, and this, this person as the, the TV and radio director was also there, but now Bashir defense team were chatting among themselves in the courtroom in Khartoum and did not realize that their microphones w w uh, were still on. So what happened? One of them was heard to say, this is slave, which is a big or oh, ugly. Ugly and big nose irritates me to this guy. The Arabic word for slave is up. For one person, they call up. And for plural, they say a beat. It is often used in Sudan to refer to the people whose perceived roots are thought to be African instead of Arab. And it's a derogatory term used to describe black people. This is very recent. And, 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 and I just want to connect this one with the sister's lecture last week when in Colombia she said you can easily uh, use racial slur to somebody. There's no uh, law criminalize or put that into. No, the same in Sudan. You can just say whatever you say and you get away with because it served the interests of particular people from saying that. It served the interests of the people who are in the power. And if you go to lay charge against any racial slurs, you will find they are the one who are in the power. Then there's nothing. So it's still, this is widely you, and this is, I brought that example recently just to connect with the, um, uh, with what happened um, uh, a few weeks ago. So there is a lot to be said. But again, um, my, then my question based on so many things. And, and the, what irritates me when you see in the website of the United Nations that Sudan is defined as an Arab country. Then on what basis you define and describe Sudan as an Arab country? We got to ask you in that question. Because if it's because of a language, Nigerian speak English. We speak of English in Nigeria more than in England or more in the UK. So is, it, is speaking a language alone qualify a nation to be classified as an Arab people? Then again, go if it's religion, Senegal, 55% of them are Muslim. But does it qualify them to be defined as an Arab people? Go to Malaysia, the same 61% of people are Muslim. But they are still Asian country. Then on what basis Sudan should be defined in the UN Charter or even in the UN website is in the group where it says Arab country. What, what the studies they did is studies before independence, but those were flawed studies, not based on the on the real, I mean on the people. It, it, it was politicized. Mm -hmm. So and then it's still 80% of the people are African who are deeply rooted in their culture, language, religion. Yes, they speak Arabic as a language. Mm -hmm. And in Sudan, it is a lingua franca language, a language that is used by different groups to communicate information. The same as Swahili, the same as English in South Africa, mm -hmm. the same as English in Kenya or in, 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 um, in USA, people with God with different languages, right? Mm -hmm. 
But we use English to communicate to each other. So it's a lingua franca language in Sudan. So I think that doesn't enough qualify a nation to be defined as an Arab people. So um, then I want to just quote um, to close my point with the um, um, with, with this um, Arabization again as uh, people define is a historical and cultural and political process designed to dislocate African from their own narratives and place them into the Arabic terms with a focus on falsification of history and civilization. And I will stop here. I, I took much time. I know that I went beyond the time. But it's, it's so much things. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. Right. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Wow. So much love on YouTube. I know we don't have a lot of time. We could probably take one question or two questions in the audience if you have any questions. So this you is have a, one question? Yeah, but anybody would have a question? I, ha I have a question. Uh, and then um, uh, we will maybe take a question if we have one online. Uh, my question uh, to Gu is what are the African people doing? Are we responding to this? Do you see consciousness growing and developing among the African people? What can we do on this side to try to aid and assist in the majority of the people in Sudan dealing with this issue? I think Prof <laughs> has put a very big question, but I'll try to answer as, 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 as I can. And it's a very important question. Yes, there's a problem, but what, what, what we must play, where should we stand? And I think the first mission that I have, and also people like me and all brothers and sisters, will be to bring consciousness to our people. To, um, because that's the first change that we have to change the mind of the people to recenter them psychologically, culturally, at least to take a position, this is not who you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, should, you are better than that, and you can do things better than that mm -hmm. if you recenter yourself mm -hmm. into your own narrative. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenge. Yeah. That's a challenge, and this is, this is a big mission for everybody and, and we can do. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, two parts. Um, I hear in the um, in Sudan that they raid into the south, kill the men, take the women, impregnate them, use those children to go back in to raid south into African uh, communities. Uh, that's one question. The other question is, what is the uh, United States of Africa, I heard that in terms of the language, that they're pushing a universal language of Swahili. Is that something that's flying, or is that Arabic, or what is that? I know that they were advocating that uh, 10 years ago when I was doing some traveling and uh, monitoring elections. I understand that the uh, United States of Africa was identifying the Swahili is a uh, universal language that everybody can communicate, and I'm not hearing that uh, being pushed or prophesied. Right. Uh, let me s start with the last one. Yeah. It has to do with Swahili thing. Because what happened now, Sudan became two countries. You see, what South Sudan has achieved, and, and, and that's where they recentered themselves. Mm -hmm. So the first thing they said, we have to be part of East African community which is a Kenyan, Uganda people look like me and look like us, and we share things together. They designed their language policy that includes Swahili as should be a replace, not necessarily, but a language that can connect them and East African community, and there is a work on which Swahili should represent African, um, I mean, people, and the language that should be used in Africa. So they're working on that. Uh, but in terms of Arabic, 
We are not, again, it's even, uh, that's a point that I went, I'm not despising somebody's culture or maybe somebody's language. But my issue is just imposition of that language and culture and religion to the people who are, the, they have their own way of life and own way of making things. That's why, that, that's, that, that's only my position is. But they have a right to develop and to maintain and even preserve their culture and, and religion and everything. Like the same we are. But don't impose those things on us. So, so but, uh, the other part was has to do with the. Um, I forgot the other part. You know, yes, we can use the language. That, that that's uh, there where people are working on that so that it connect. I mean, um, to I mean, unite people in terms of linguistically, right? So, from South Sudan. No, they are even. It's a part of education. They now they have a new language policy mm -hmm. in 2012. English is official. It used to be, as I said, when Sudan was one, so English and Arabic. So now what they say when they got their own country, Arabic is not anymore our language. It, it, yeah, it's a lingua, there's a pidgin called uh, Juba Arabic. Mm -hmm. It's a pidgin mixed between local languages and, and Arabic and English and all words. But it's not a standard. It's a, it's a way of communicating information. Mm -hmm. But officially in the country and the language of, of education and medium of education is English and their own lang languages. They develop already their local languages mm -hmm. that they can replace Arabic or become a resources for their own agency. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. Yes, we have one more from YouTube. They say, can a real African union, I mean for the interests of African culture, work with Arabs in Northern Africa? In other words, should Africans exclude Arabs as Shinwizi suggests so as to build a true and genuine African union for Africans from the continent and those from the diaspora. Right. In this, in this point really reminded me, uh, there is a two points in that one. There's continental unity and the unity of the people. So and then people will say, which one is more important? To unite a people based on their, uh, their tradition and culture and principle or we seek continental unity? based on geography, without being people as uh, united in their way of doing things. And that's to everybody. So if you look at the Africa from geographical perspective, so those North Africans, the part of Africa, and it was Africa. It was invaded, it came in, and then it was, it is truly Africa in every aspect of life. But we know the civilization and occupation that happened that I already presented earlier from Patient to Macedonians to Arab to Turks, and then it resulted into whole nose part. It's been taken. I highlighted too. So the whole nose was taken, and now the influence of Arabization is coming down. You see, those are already, now it's coming to Mal Mali, Chad, Niger, and then down to, 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 to yeah, that's what happened. It, it's just in. It's coming. The, w the storm is uh, moving gradually. If people are not waking up to stop that storm, that was basically it's about. Right. Thank <laughs> I think we, we went beyond time, but thank you so much again. Thanks once again. If you <laughs> okay. Kibori. 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 Is that all right? How was uh, <laughs> Uh, you, yeah, you, uh, who wants to say something? Yeah, you, you go, you go, you go, you go. Sister, Sister Howell will be speaking, I uh, think, in November. Yes, right yeah, yeah, yeah. But thank you so much, uh, uh, Tugu. We are truly, 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 you know, appreciated and I'm proud of you. Thank what you've gone through all the years, and you're still standing. And uh, doing what you're doing, but we feel that this is your duty. Yes. You should do it. Yes. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Malufi Santi. We are so proud what you're raising awareness and your leadership for what should be done as an African people to go back to who we are really. Right. And um, and this is definitely remind me for you know the Arabization. What's happening in Africa and in Sudan? is even disconnected the Sudanese people from Africa. Yes. So we have been completely been disconnected. Right. 
our language has been disconnected. That's right. So I remember when I was 17 mm -hmm. and in a high school, if you uh, speak four languages, because speaking four languages, which is uh, one of the native languages, so I've been beaten every single morning mm. for being just uh, speaking your own language. Mm. And then those Arabization civilization mm. also been using rape mm -hmm. in Gumen yes. as a weapon yes. to destroy whole community. Yes. And that's been happening, it's not just in Darfur. Yes. That's been continued in South Sudan, it's yes. been continued all of that. Yes. And that was their mission. Yes. So they can destroy whole African community yes. So people can be missed out of their yes. identity. They yes. don't know who they are. Yes. So now we went liberated ourselves to go back mm. to who we are. Mm -hmm. That's now they're killing us. That's right. So, but this is the mission. We are All doing right. it, Thank you. and there is no way we have to Powerful. do it. I've been sentenced twice in my own young life. Mm. Just because for speaking out. Mm. But thank well, you so much. Thank yeah. you so much, Sister Howard. <laughs> thank you, Sister Howard. Sister Howard, we will be hearing from her later in our series. This is wonderful. I, I just want to thank Brother Tugu. Brother Tugu, uh, you have been sent, uh, as we say in, in, in Georgia. Uh, you, you have been touched, and uh, you have touched us. And this is a very, very powerful uh, talk. Uh, it will reverberate around the world among black people and other people as well who understand the great crisis in the great country of Sudan. Uh, I want to thank all of you who have come. I want to announce that on September the 25th, at the same time on YouTube, those of you who are on YouTube, uh, we will have m the angriest man in America. That's what he calls himself the angriest man in America, Michael Cord, attorney Michael Cord, will be speaking right here on September the 25th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you can, you do everything you can do to be listening to this outstanding uh, historian, legal authority, a powerful diplomat in politics, you, you've, got to, you've got to listen to him. So tell everybody, 4 o'clock, September the 25th, at the Malefe Kete Asante Institute. I want to thank everybody, those of you who have come here physically, and those of you who are online. I want to thank uh, uh, Toyosi Abaderes, our, our technical staff, I want to thank uh, the, uh, who got us uh, going uh, today. I want to thank also Brother Kareem and Brother Carlton and, uh, and Sister Anna Yaninga for their work in this uh, uh, institute. Uh, thank all the board members and those of you who have come. And we will eventually, I think uh, in the next season when we start putting our new lectures together, we want to have one of our old timers, uh, Brother Farouk, to uh, get ready to do his thing on psychology. He's the president of the black uh, psychologists uh, in this country for, for a while and the editor of many of their papers. So we're just really happy to have uh, uh, Dr. Farouk here. So okay, um, and of course, uh, Brother Tugu will probably ask you about your name, but that's another question. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, we are just so happy to have all of our people here, great people, and we thank you. We say we call upon our ancestors, far and near, the mother of our father, mother of our mothers, the father of our fathers, to render mercy, to bear witness for the liberation and the victory of all oppressed people forever. And we say it is done. Asante. Asante, Asante. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike.